Now, Henry, I want to bring it back to, to your journey and, mm-hmm. and kind of look at that journey because certainly what you're doing now is, by any standards, a successful psychic medium who's out there, you know, in the world, being practical, in this lovely, you know, room and having this chat. Um, tell us how you got there and what can we learn from you? And how, you know, how did well, you go about your path? It's interesting because growing up, I was very, very aware of spirit. Uh, as I said earlier, um, I was growing up in London and Scotland, and the house in Scotland is a, a very big sort of house, big rooms and big ancestral portraits bearing down on us, and a lot of heritage and a lot of history with my family. And there was an element of most of the males in my family were almost earmarked to go and join the armed forces. We were all soldiers naval officers, commanding officers, special forces, all that sort of stuff. So we were very rich military heritage in our family. And I've always been very sensitive. And since I was very small, I would be very aware of spirit in the house, well, everywhere really, but the house, because it's such an old house, it was full of spirit. I would actually have a real fear of death when I was very, very small. I was quite scared of it. To, well, that's an understatement, really. Actually, Henry, yeah. let's just back up and define this word spirit because I think it would mean a lot of mm. different things for people. And mm. What is spirit to you? Spirit to me, uh, when I refer to spirit, spirit is what we all are. It's the consciousness that we're all fabricated from, basically. That's okay. what we're all about. That's, that's my understanding of spirit. And when I refer to being aware of spirit, um, in that context, I will be referring to the spirits um, of people who have been here before. Mm-hmm. So, for example, my ancestors or friends or members of my family who have passed the spirit, as it were, so have died physically, and their spirit is still very much around in their home, in, in this case, my, my ancestral home in Scotland. Mm-hmm. And as a small boy, they used to be walking around all the time, and I wouldn't necessarily see them... You know that film, The Sixth Sense, where the boys always seeing the people walking around, the dead people as well. I see dead people at great line. Um, it wasn't so much physically seeing them. Occasionally we would. But actually most of the times you can understand with anything, and I would refer to this as mediumship, mm-hmm. is, is a mental exercise. So my mind, the inside of my mind, is being used like a cinema screen. Mm. And so I'm aware of some, somebody in the room, for example, as I tune in, I'll know where they're standing. As I tune in, I'll see them. I'll see them in my mind. I'll see what they look like, mm. how old they are, all that sort of stuff. Anyway, I would see that all the time and people would be physically sitting in my bed. People would be walking around. I'd hear voices. Mm-hmm. I would see things out the corner of my eye. And it got to the point where I was thinking, gosh, when we die, is this honestly what's going to happen to us? When I die, am I just going to be wandering around bothering people like me? I'm thinking, <laughs> God. I thought, it doesn't give a huge amount of inspiration for life, really. You're thinking, gosh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to trudge through life, get through my life, get to the other end, die, and then I'm going to be floating around bothering people like me. And actually, how did, actually, you, know, how did you know it was not your imagination? Though? Because I could actually back it up. I would, I would bring up the subject from time to time in my family. It was, it was not something that I could do that easily because they weren't really open to it. They, my mother is very sensitive and she's always aware of a presence in a room or the energy shifting or the change in temperature and stuff. So she was always aware of spirit. She could never, back then she would never see it, but she would feel it. And I think she was aware that I was picking up on things, but I don't think she realized to what extent I was seeing things. So it was very hard for me to express that. I guess there's always that searching question, oh, I'm imagining this, no, no, this can't be right. Yeah. But the thing that's so funny is I'll see somebody walking around, I will have a conversation with them, they'll be communicating with me, and then I'll go to maybe another family house up the road, and there'll be a picture of him hanging up above the mantelpiece. Mm-hmm. And I won't have necessarily known about this guy necessarily, or had met him before. And that started to... I suppose, break down that whole, is it my imagination thing? And I realized after time, I was starting to finish people's sentences. I was starting to be more aware of uh, what people were doing and how things, situations were going to pan out, what was going to happen. And I would start to 
see things before they happened. And it actually got to the point where it got quite scary. Because it just How old were to, you at this point? Ten? Um, it, this, I suppose I was aware around about five or six, really. That was when I was really aware. But it was between about that age and about the age of 12. That's when it was really prolific. That's when it was very busy. But I didn't have any control over it. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to switch it off. I didn't know how to ground myself, mm. protect myself, or anything like that. So I was completely exposed to the elements in that respect. Mm. And so, you know, it was quite sporadic. It was quite spontaneous. It would sometimes ambush me, surprise me. Mm-hmm. And at 12, they turned it down for me. I do believe, when I say they, that spirit again. Mm-hmm. I do feel that I had a sense that for whatever reason I was possibly meant to be doing this kind of work or meant to be aware of spirit, or meant to be working with spirit, but I wasn't sure how, or when, or for how long, or, or, or what they wanted me to do exactly. But they turned it down, as it were, when I was about 12, and it went a bit quiet. It, it, yeah, I was just still aware of the energies and the presence and stuff and things, wherever I was, not just the house I grew up in, anywhere I went, really. And I get to the point where my parents would go out for lunch or something, take my brother and I with us, and I would... Want, wouldn't want to go into the house because I knew there'd be something waiting for me in the house. Mm. And it used to scare me. And fast forward now up to the age of 19, I was working out at sea. And Navy? No, Merchant Navy. I was on a Scottish salvage boat mm. off of Spain. And I was a deckhand. I was 19. We were working 30 miles offshore on a shipwreck in four and a quarter thousand feet of water. We were tripping a world debt record at the time for commercial cargo recovery. Wow. We were recovering copper bars, copper wire bars off a shipwreck in, in four and a quarter thousand feet of water. So the depth of the water was the same height that Ben Nevis is from sea level. So to give you an idea, that's that's a lot of that's a lot of water. Really? And I worked on that boat for a couple of years, and I was 19, so it was my first season, and the season ran from about March up to about November, mm-hmm. and that's the window we had for weather, and then November it would close in, and we'd have to sail back up around to the east coast of Scotland. And it was about midnight, we were heading back into shore, because it was getting quite rough, it was about, the boat was going 10 knots east, and we were in about 5,000 feet of water at that time. So we were right on the Atlantic shelf. The skipper was up in the wheelhouse, driving the boat. The first mate was in his cabin, asleep. And the other deckhand who I shared a cabin with was down in, his, in, his, in the cabin as well. So there was nobody on deck except me. I wandered out on deck and I saw one of the fenders hanging over the side of the boat. And I thought, you know, I'll just go and grab it and put it in. Mm-hmm. And there's a load of barrels that were lashed to the side of the... The fender's like this, the rear... It's like a tractor tire. So they push it out between the boat and oh, the pier. So okay. when they come in against the pontoon or a pier, right, right. it it's just protects the boat. It's like a cushion, really. It's like a, sort of like a suspension. It's like a bumper, really. Yeah. And it was hanging over the side. It was getting sort of washed about. So I sort of casually went across the deck and leant over. I was a bit like a deck monkey, really. And I'd lean over, I'd pull the rope up. And as I did so, the boat rolled. And I went straight over the boat, over the side. And as I went over, I put my foot through rail, but of course every time the boat rolled on the port side, it's all happening on the port side of the boat, so the left hand side of the boat, I was going underwater, I was going right up to my knees and ankles underwater with this rope, this fender attached to the rope wrapped around these two fingers, it just locked itself around these two fingers, I couldn't undo it. Mm-hmm. So there's a rather large tractor tire trying to head south 5,000 feet, the boat's going east 10 knots, and I'm kind of stuck somewhere in the middle. And I realized for the first time in my life, this is my first opportunity to check out. I just had this very clear understanding that actually this particular, this precise moment in time, if I wanted to, I could let go and it would all be over. Why? I I would die, physically die. And most people think, oh God, how terrifying. Mm. You know what? I wasn't at all. Mm. I was incredibly calm. Mm. And I remember thinking, I was calm for a few seconds because I actually got quite angry. Um, I think quite feisty, the Celtic blood. Um, I was being dragged underwater, and every time the boat rolled over onto the starboard side, so on the right hand side, I looked up on the deck and I was aware of four beings. And again, this is beings I could see in my mind just standing on the deck. Wow. 
And they weren't frowning me or anything like that. They were just four beings. They were just standing there watching me. They weren't saying anything. They were just sitting there watching to see what I was going to do. I was 19. I was very fit, very strong, very keen for life. And I was angry and I started swearing and, <laughs> and really swearing, like properly swearing. <laughs> Um, sort of stuff, soldiers' language, you know what I mean? I was really swearing at these beings, thinking, no, this is ridiculous, I'm too young to be going, I've got far too much to be getting on in my life, this is not on, I'm not happy with this at all. Um, <laughs> but obviously, laced with some very, yeah. very sort of coarse language as well. I was, it was, I suppose, some people might deem it quite disrespectful towards the beings. But I really wasn't too worried about my, my, my sort of manners, really, with them. I was thinking, I'm, a, I'm on the verge of dying if I want to. Absolutely. I'm about to die if I want to. If I let go of my boot, that's it. There's no way they'd ever find me. I'd be gone. And I remember going berserk and thinking, this is ridiculous, but staying very calm, realising, actually, right, if I let go, I'm going to die. If I don't let go, how am I going to get back on the boat? Because I've got lots to be going on with. And actually, for a second, I thought, gosh, I might die. I'm thinking, but I'm only 19. This is crazy. You know, I've got like a whole life ahead of me, but I don't want to go at 19. I'm not even 20 yet, and I'm, I'm about to die. This is not funny. And I said to them, I said, look, this is ridiculous. I've got way too much to be going on with. I've got far too much to be doing in my life. I've got work to do. And they obviously took that as, that was my decision made. The being disappeared. And about five seconds later, the first mate just randomly walked out on deck. And he came out, no idea, and he saw me hanging over the side of the boat. So he went, what are you doing there? So just cut the rope. This is ridiculous. So he helped me on board. Bang. And from that moment on, I think they turned the dial back up again. But also, my fear of death disappeared. Could you describe these beings? You just knew they were present. They looked quite... Um, there, there were two that really stuck out of my mind. There's one, he was in a very long, almost feels like he was in a very long sort of overcoat, really, the one on the right-hand side. So as I'm hanging over the side of the boat, I'm looking back on the deck, and you've got the four beings here. One on, the, on this side had a very dark, almost a dark grey overcoat, and he seemed to be the boss out of those four people, those four beings. They didn't feel like my family. They didn't feel like anybody. You know what it mean. You know what I mean when I say I felt like I knew them and they knew me. You think they were your sole family? Quite possibly. But of course, at nineteen, I didn't. And, and, and obviously, in that situation, I didn't. I wasn't thinking about analysing it. I just. I was just aware of four beings. But I knew that they knew me and I knew them. Yeah. But they weren't like grandparents or family that I would remember necessarily. So yeah. Answer your question quite possibly, so family. Mm. But the moment I made that decision, they went. Mm -hmm. That's all they needed to hear. Mm -hmm. And then everything started to happen. So everything started to accelerate. And I, I got into my chefing, as you do. I came off the boats and, and ended up in the kitchen doing an apprenticeship and, and started to become a professional chef. And the spiritual side, I was become, became more and more aware of spirit. Why did you choose to be a chef? Though? I think I went to join the army at 19. That's, that's before I joined that boat. I did my basic training with the British Army, with the Scottish Division, with the Brat Watch. Uh, what a recruit does in six months, we did in seven weeks. And I passed that top of that and went on to do my selection to mm -hmm. be an officer. Mm -hmm. And I was deferred for a year, which really not my confidence. Mm -hmm. I wasn't failed, I was just told you're very young, you're 19, the average age that we're taking at the moment, the graduates are 21, 22. Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got a couple of years anyway, head start mm -hmm. on a lot of people. So why don't you go away for a year, grow up basically, <laughs> uh, come back in a year and then come have another go. Yeah. You only get two goes at uh, the selection for the officer selection. Mm -hmm. And I think if I'd gone back, I'd have probably got it. But for whatever reason, being a sensitive soul that I was, I took it quite personally. I thought, gosh, maybe I'm not meant to be in this. So I thought, I've in my mind, I thought maybe I failed this. So I ended up on this boat, which was extraordinary, and spent two years on her. Came back to London after being on, on this boat, and I've always been a bit of a maverick and a bit of a nonconformist. I don't like to be pinned down with rules and regulations. 
And at school, I was at boarding school for 10 years mm -hmm. and I went to a very good school when I was 13 to 18. And as a new boy, you're issued all your books and everything. And we were issued um, a piece of paper with all the school rules on. I'm pleased to say that I broke every single one of those rules <laughs> within my first year, That's which great. is crazy, you know, but some people think, why did you do that? Well, just why not, you know? <laughs> and I've always been a bit naughty like that. Um, and I got into the shipping. I came back to London, got a bar job, thought it would be good to get involved in shipping, shipbreaking, something along those lines. So I've always had a, a love affair with the sea. And while I was putting letters out to these big shipbrokers and shipping companies, etc., and having interviews and things, I got a bar job. And bar job kind of transformed into, I, I, I had a weekend off, I got a hernia. I'm, this is obviously a very abbreviated version of, of my life story, but I'm trying to put in as much detail as possible without trying to string it out a bit. Um, I had a weekend off and got a hernia. And I ended up having about five, six weeks off after having a hernia operation. Uh, not a hernia, an appendix, well, an appendicitis. Uh, St. Thomas's Hospital um, ended up in there, had the operation, had about five, six weeks off because I just wasn't allowed to lift anything. Mm -hmm. Came back to my bar job, which mm -hmm. is gone. And while I'd, while I'd been away, the executive head chef of this group that I worked for had been sacked and this new guy had come in and he's an Australian chef and I met him and I came in on the day that he was explaining his first ever menu to the staff and I've always enjoyed food. My mother's a fabulous cook and always <clears throat> enjoyed the cooking side of things and got talking to Josh and Josh said, look, I'm looking for somebody to train up. Would you be interested in in training, he said, I can't pay very much. I think he paid me something like, I think he basically said, this is on a Friday and I had that weekend off. I was going home to see my parents in the countryside. And he said, right, I'm looking for somebody to train up. I can't pay very much. If you want to come and work with me and work for me and learn how to cook and learn how to cook like you've never cooked before, mm. I will see you outside my kitchen at 8 o'clock on Monday morning. And if you show up outside my kitchen at 8 o'clock on Monday morning, I promise you I will make a commitment to you for at least one year mm -hmm. that I will take you on as an apprentice. Now, if you show up at 8 o'clock on Monday morning, that means you're, you've agreed in a verbal contract that you're going to work for me for one year minimum. The only way out of that contract is if I sack you. Now, that's the deal. I was like... And I, of course, there's a naughty side of Henry thinking, cool, I like this. This is cool. I like this. This is a bit, a bit off the wall. Yeah, I think I'm up for that. And I think he was going to pay me something like 9,000, nine and a half thousand pounds a year. This is the early 90s. Which is nothing, money. nothing, nothing, huh? nothing. Gosh, I don't know how I survived on that. In the early 90s. 90. I don't know what much inflation is. Yeah, yeah no, no, <laughs> but, but nine and a half grand a year, trust okay. me, it's nothing. Right. Um, I thought, wow. That's not very much at all. I've been earning more before. And I th but I, that, that was irrelevant. I just thought, no, this is an amazing opportunity. This guy's like the new kid on the block. He's an amazing chef. Let's go and learn with him. Anyway, cut a long story short, I ended up working for him for about two and a half years <clears throat> and, and learned my craft as a chef. And from there, I went on and, and ended up running some very serious kitchens and doing some amazing work and culminating up to about a few years ago where I was a top end sort of private chef cooking for some quite well known. And all this time you were sensitive? Always been sensitive. And the healing energy as it were was always going into my food. Mm. Um, and there's a very funny story actually. It was probably the most serious job I had uh, as a chef it was up in North Norfolk, a place called the Victoria Holcomb. Now it was um <clears throat> would have been in two thousand and one I was headhunted to, I, in between learning to cook and 2001, I got to travel all around the world with my cooking. Everything from cooking on private yachts in the Caribbean, to private households, to cooking in Spain, cooking um, all over the place basically, car racing teams, famous Gulf McLaren racing team. Uh, at the moment, 24 hour endurance racing, Formula One teams, all that sort of stuff. I got to cook with some Pretty cool people. I mean, it was hard work. It's never easy. And 
got to Norfolk in 2001, and it was probably the most high-profile job, the Victoria Alcum. And I had a sous chef called Richie, who's now emigrated to Australia with my pastry chef. Um, and they live in Australia now in the Northern Territories with a couple of kids now. But he was my sous chef at the time. And I remember one time I, I had a speciality. I made these fish cakes. They were Thai-style fish cakes. And they were just pure fish. And they were really, really delicious. And I used to make a very sort of spicy Thai liquor, which I put through the pulp fish. I made these. They're like fish balls, basically. They're big, they're solid. And they're really, really delicious. And I served them with three sort of sauces. Very simple, but just yummy. And they were one of my trademarks one of my signature dishes. And Richie could never get his head around the fact that he would follow hmm. the recipe word for word, you know, pinch of this, pinch of that, spoon of this, you know, he would do it literally as it was written down. And for whatever reason, the fish cakes never tasted the same as mine. <laughs> he could never understand. Right. And I had a kind of sense, but somebody pointed it out to me later on. I said, okay, Richie, I'll show you how to make these. I'll get two lots of ingredients in and we'll, we'll make it together. We'll stand alongside each other and we'll do it blow by yeah. blow and I'll show you how to make it. So we did that, <clears throat> you know, pinch of this, smash of that. And he was standing next to me with a big mixing bowl and we were mixing the mix and doing absolutely everything identically. Made the fish, fish cake, let them chill out a bit in the fridge so they just firm up a bit and then we cook them. And sure enough, Mine were absolutely delicious, and his just didn't have quite didn't quite have that edge. And what I realised later on was when I was actually cooking, lots of heating energy was coming out of my hands into the food, mm. and that's something that I've become more aware of. And obviously now with my work, mm. when I am cooking now, even if it's for fun or with pleasure with friends, mm. I always tell people: if you're angry, don't cook, mm. don't bother, go and get a takeaway. You know what I mean? Really, seriously. There's no point in cooking if you're angry or upset because mm -hmm. that energy goes into the food. That's very interesting. Don't you think? <clears throat> I mean, I, I've also had that. I mean, I've eaten at some very nice restaurants. And there's mm. some times where you just, the food is just zing about it. Mm. And then often you go to the same restaurant sometimes for like still another high end place, but mm. it still doesn't have that zing. Mm. And then I'm also thinking about art. You know, like if you look at the Monet or you look at the Picasso, Love it just jumps out. I mean, in the end, also, if you look at the at a facsimile of it or, or a reproduction of it in the book, it's entirely different from looking at the real piece. Mm. What is that? You see, I mean, it has to be energetic. That's love. It's, it's inspired. I, I, I really do feel when somebody paints a beautiful picture or sings a beautiful song or, you know, these great composers like Beethoven and Mozart and people like that, or even modern day rock musicians, or Led Zeppelin, or I don't know, um, um, Ellie Goulding, or Adele. I mean, I'm sure that is all inspired. I really do. I do feel that whether they're aware of it or not, there's this beautiful inspiration that's coming through their, their consciousness yep. and helping them to forge that song, or that plate of food, or do that beautiful painting of, of the water lilies. And I really do feel that's love that's actually responsible for that. That's Because mm. I think, in my understanding of spirit, it, it's it's all love, it's unconditional love. So it's that energy of love that's putting that beautiful inspirational picture on the wall or making our eyes well up when we listen to that song when it's being sung. Mm. That, that song that resonates with us, that really makes our heart open up. Yeah. That sometimes makes us feel sad or maybe reminds us of a relationship we've had that's all been inspired. I really do feel that. And I think, going back to what I was saying with food, if you're angry, upset, sad, don't cook. It goes into the food. Get a takeaway. You know what I mean? Or get somebody else to cook for you who's up for it. Mm -hmm. But when I'm in the mood to cook, yeah. that's because I'm happy, I'm feeling inspired, yeah. and that energy goes into the food. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we're all energy, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And I think we all have, everyone in this planet has their little strength, their little bit of magic yeah. that comes in, whether it's, I don't know, being amazing with numbers, uh, being a painter, being musical, being creative in some way, shape or form, mm. or just being very special towards your friends or whatever it may be. Yeah. We have a little sliver. It can be a little sliver or it can be a big, fat, juicy sliver, sliver if we're 
aware of it, but everyone has it. Yeah. And I think it's about finding that. Yeah. And it's almost like intention, isn't it? Mm. It's like, what is the basic blueprint for this action you're going to take? Mm. And chances are, if that intention is love, whatever you do mm. is going to bloom into something beautiful. Absolutely. If you've got your heart and soul, that wonderful expression, and you put that into your work, the chances are you're going to absolutely scream ahead of the competition or scream ahead of your colleagues mm. and your co-workers. If you've got that much passion about something, chances are you're going to excel at it. And I think a lot of people struggle to find what that passion is in their life. Mm. And often I think a very small part of what we're all about, those of us who are slightly more aware than other people, those of us who are desperately, well not desperately, that's the wrong word, those of us who are keenly trying to find out who we are and what we're all about, one of our responsibilities, I feel, is to inspire others mm. to find that inspiration within them. Mm. In which you're doing way, in this video. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But I, I do feel, I mean, you know, I, I don't feel life is meant to be simple. It's not meant to be easy. I mean, some people would argue and say, you know, life's a piece of cake. Other people think, no, life's hard. It's, I think it's, it's as hard or as easy as you want to make it. Really, or oh, as you chose to make it before Absolutely. you came into this Absolutely. I also feel, I also understand that that's something else. That we come in on a contract as yeah. well. We definitely sign up to this life. Yeah. I'm absolutely certain of that. Yeah. And some of us will be very aware of the life that we've signed up to. Others won't have a clue. I just wonder, gosh, why is it so hard? Why are we always going through a life of abuse and broken relationships? Mm. And actually, when they get across home at the end of the day, as it were, when they've decided to check out and go home, they'll think, oh, yeah, I did sign up for that, didn't I? Mm. And that's when they sit back and review the fact whether or not they've actually learned anything from it. Yeah. Whether they've learned the lessons that they wanted to learn as a spirit, as a soul. Um, it's it's a massive, massive topic. Um, it's something that I could talk about for days, to be honest. Yeah, I want to talk to you about your, your mm. work with the spiritualist movement mm. as well. But let's finish your, your story, mm. just to mm. tie up that loose end. So you, you, you quit being a chef and you started... How did you... Did you meet a, a psychic mentor? Or? I did. Um, North Norfolk, where this amazing kitchen was in Victoria, I left there after a couple of years and decided to remain in the area. And I'd received sort of a lot of national acclaim for my cooking. I'd featured in national press and magazines and all the national newspapers and had an article on me, a new magazine, all that sort of stuff. And I was kind of making some proper impressions on the on the culinary world and I was, it was getting quite exciting and due to a few sort of sticky moments with um, a new manager who came in I decided actually I didn't want to stick around and I resigned basically and it's a big lesson for me and it's taken me quite a few years to get my head around as to why I did that and why I behaved the way I did um, there's nothing I did necessarily that um, force that to happen. It was all my doing, really. I think they wanted me to hang around. But there was a side of Henry that actually felt, no, I don't want to be here. And I kind of threw it all through the towel in. I was living up the road with a couple of dogs. I split up from a girl, with a girlfriend I'd been living with for a couple of years. And I was in a really, really low place. I probably was suffering from some form of depression, to be totally honest. Gosh. And after this, all your success with the cooking... Yeah. I, I was, I'd hit rock bottom. Wow. I felt really awful about life. I just didn't care. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, it's almost as if my confidence, my self-esteem, my inspiration had just sort of been extinguished. I just felt rubbish. And of course, the, all that Henry knew at that moment in his life was how to cook. So I thought it was a good idea to set up a catering company. So I did that. But my heart wasn't in it, really. <clears throat> and I'd been living, I'd moved into a house, a, a sort of a sprawling old house, which I was paying a peppercorn rent for on a neighbouring estate. It was a big six-bedroom house, very old, sort of, um, sort of 18th century house. 
with a lot of garden and stuff and, and, and an old butcher shop on the end, which is what I was going to use for my business. And I was going to do things like weddings and canopy parties and that sort of thing, dinner parties. And there was a lady who kept horses in the field next door to my house, a lady called Flo, nicknamed Flo, but her real name was Teresa Bannon. She passed away a couple of years ago now, but um, she was an orphan gypsy. She was just very cool. She swore like a man. She fought like a man. She was about five <laughs> foot three or something. Um, How do you know she fought like a man? Nice. She used to get into fights all the time in the local pub and stuff. She was just brilliant. She was fabulous. I mean, she was proper. There was no sort of sweetness and light with her. You know what I mean? She she was all love, but she was real. You know what I mean? She was. She'd had the trials and tribulations of life tenfold. So she kind of. She had that attitude, which was amazing, which is what's so special about her, to be honest. And I was coming over one day, I'd just come back into, into the house, and I had a big sort of area of gravel around the back where I parked my car. And uh, I'd been there for about three, three to four months, something like three and a half months. And up prior to that, I'd only ever seen Flo standing in the middle of the field, sprinkling chicken feed on the ground for the chickens, or hay for the horses, and, and she's always in the middle of the field. I'm like, morning, afternoon, and that was about it, really. I never really had any conversations with her. Anyway, that, this particular day, I drove in, and she went, you, come here. And I sort of looked at her, look, me, she said, well, do you think I'm talking to anyone else? I said, looked around and thought, no, obviously not. And so I went over to the fence, and she said, no, no and I'm not going to attempt a Norfolk accent, because I don't want to embarrass myself. But she had a very, very strong Norfolk accent. <coughs> which is sort of a bit like a West Country accent, but it isn't, if you know what I mean. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And she said, you, my darling, have been in a very old pickle like this. And she said, you're a mess. She said, you're, you're in a really dark place, and I know you are. And in the space of about five minutes, she absolutely pinpointed my life. Mm. And to the point where it would compare to one of the most... Re uh, most accurate readings you could ever possibly have with a medium. But she nailed it in five minutes. She just basically summed me up in five minutes. Nobody had ever done that in my life before. I was about 29, 30 when this happened. Was this your first psychic reading? Unofficially speaking, yes. Yeah. It was unbelievable. And where most people, I think, would probably say, go away, that's just scary. You're just freaking out now. You've been rooting through my bins or reading my bank statements or reading my personal correspondence or anything like that. It, it's that, it was that accurate with, with what she actually said about me. But Henry felt really relieved. Mm. And I'm not going to say the language, but I said, thank somebody can actually tell me what's going on with me. Mm. And I felt so, I felt really loved for a start. And I didn't know this woman, but there was just love, just pouring out of her yeah and she said i'm here to help <laughs> you she said you and i are meant to meet my darling mm. she said, you're in a mess she said the first thing we need to do is to get you better wow she said go and put the kettle on she said don't you dare put any of that earl gray rubbish in the cup for me she said i'll have two pg tea bags i'll have a strong four sugars and lots of milk mm. but it's all right like, okay she said, i'll meet you down the bottom of my field in 10 minutes. She must you, have seen the potential in you as well. This absolutely, time. absolutely. She said, I'll see you in the bottom of the field in 10 minutes. Okay, wow. Very profound moment in my life, I just thought. You know when you, we, we have all these waypoints, I like to call them in our life, where you just think, wow, this is a really significant moment in my life. You just, and I felt quite tearful. My eyes were welling up. I was like, wow, you know, and I could just feel love oozing out of this woman. And she's just the most amazing person. She's an extraordinary woman. And we got down to the bottom of the field with cups of tea. And she looked at me and she goes, um, Stop talking. I said, What do you mean? She said, Just start talking. And it's that whole British reserve that I've been raised with. I immediately, say your flow, I immediately turned away and started looking across the field and talking away from her. She went, no, 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 no. Look into my eyes and talk to me. Hmm. So I was like, and the moment I did that and I started talking, I started to cry. So my heart opened up. She yeah. opened, she activated something. It was her healing, which is an amazing healer. 
and this will all come out as, as the story unfolds. And I just felt incredibly comfortable with this person. Mm. There's nothing romantic, nothing like that at all. I, she had a fella, and yeah, not that I was looking at her in that way anyway. Um, I realised that she had been, I would say, divinely placed mm. for me. I definitely feel that, and I still do to this day, and I always will. And she said, go on, let it out. And I just broke down in tears. Mm. And I just cried. And I cried. She said, go on, keep crying. Go on, have a tea, my darling. Go on, keep crying. It's all right, it's okay to cry, you know. You're allowed to cry, you know, all this mm. sort of stuff. And I've been raised very much of the train of thought, stiff up a lip, don't cry, it shows your weakness, all that sort of yeah. stuff. And actually, I'm a big, cuddly teddy bear and super sensitive, but raised in a, in a family that were commanding officers and brigadiers and colonels and generals and, you know, big sort of, you know, it, there was a lot of expectations on my shoulders. Yeah, it's very patriarchal. And it was almost as if she had my tap and she just opened the tap and said, go let it out. Hmm. All that hurt, that sadness, that upset, everything just poured out. And she turned to me and she said, it's lovely. She said, it's really, really lovely. She said, now we need to get you fixed, my darling. She said, now, I've got a guy here called Charlie. And he's been trying to get hold of you for five years. Now, at this stage, Charlie, the only Charlie I could think of who it was, was my best friend. I remember looking at my watch and looking at the date, thinking, gosh, it's five years ago to today that Charlie died. Charlie was my best friend. Wow. Charlie, I was over at, I was out at sea, I was in the Caribbean working at sea, and he was living in Scotland. Charlie one day decided to take upon himself to end his life with a shotgun. And he poured a, you know, he was at home with his parents and he drew a shotgun out of the cupboard, went down onto the South Downs, waited for the sun to come up, and then took his own life. What was happening in his head? I think there was a lot of depression there, to be honest. And I think, again, I don't think things were that happy at home, really, with his parents and family, obviously, just in case any of his family do end up watching. Um, they understand this, but obviously I'm not going to name his surname or anything like that. But anyway, Charlie was my best friend, and he killed himself at 26. He shot himself at 26. And she looked at me and said, now he's called Charlie, isn't he? He shot himself, isn't he? He's short, 5'6". You must have had a lot of trauma around that. Oh, massive amounts. He was my best mate. Yeah. And she described what he looked like, how tall he was, what he was wearing. The, the brand of cigarette that he used to smoke, mm. the type of beer that he used to drink. Mm. And you didn't tell her anything? No, about no, it. there's no way she could have known. Yeah. I'd been living in Norfolk by that stage for about three years. And I'd come away from where I'd been before, mm -hmm. uh, the Isle of Wight actually, in fact, when it did all happened, or just before then actually when I was out at sea. And there's absolutely no way anybody in Norfolk, I'd never spoken about him, never mentioned him. You know, when he died, that was it, bang. I just kind of shut the door and everything. Moved up to Norfolk several years later. <clears throat> so there's absolutely no way that she could have known anything about Charlie. Mm -hmm. Or had any kind of correlation or connection with him and I. Even if she'd been sitting through a victory or anything like that, there's absolutely no way yeah. that she could have known. Yeah. And I really do believe that she's a medium. You know, she's a brilliant medium. Yeah. And she said, he's been trying to get hold of you for five years. You've been ignoring him five years, he's been trying to get hold of you for five years, he's been trying to talk to you, communicate with you, because you've been in a real mess, he's been trying to help you. And of course I cried even more, I thought, my God, this is, I said, where is he at the moment? Like this? Said, he's just standing over there by the tree. <laughs> and I was like, really? I said, which tree? He said, there, I couldn't see him, but I kind of get a sense. I thought, hmm, I couldn't see him, but I could feel the energy, it was amazing. Mm. And of course, because I wasn't a trained or a developed medium as such, it just would happen sporadically. It wouldn't, I couldn't say, right, I'm going to tune in on people walking around or spirits. I, I didn't know how to do that, so I hadn't perfected it. So I wasn't aware of how to open up to the point where I could see people. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, she went into very, very big detail about as to who he was, what he was like, how it all came about. And it all made sense, as if she had known him, as long as I'd known him. I mean, it was really, really amazing, beautifully comforting. And she said, now, 
I said, how, how can you do that? And how does that work? And she goes, because I'm a medium, darling. I said, a medium? So that's what a medium is. A medium, yeah. We can talk to dead people, sweetheart. And she put it in, in, in plain English, you know what I mean? She didn't yeah. flare it up. She didn't do the whole smoking rooms. She yeah. said, something I've always been able to do, my darling. She said, you know, when people die, I can see their spirit. Their spirit will come back and communicate. If I'm sitting with maybe one of their loved ones or their friends or family, and it's appropriate, they tend to come in and I'll convey messages or evidence as to who they are. Mm -hmm. And that's how mediums work. Right. I said, that's amazing. That's incredibly clever. She said, you're a medium. Mm. So what do you mean? She said, you're a medium. She says, and this is, bear in mind, this is about, this is about nine, ten, ten years ago now. <clears throat> she goes, yeah, it's about ten years ago. It'll be ten years ago, beginning of next year. She said, you're going to be doing this work. Mm -hmm. You are a medium. You're a healer. You're going to be on stage doing this. You're going to be doing this on television. You're going to be doing this on radio. You're going to be traveling around the world doing it. You're going to be teaching it. You're going to be demonstrating it. You're going to be doing sessions. You're going to be doing this, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. You're also going to be healing a lot of animals, a lot of horses, a lot of dogs, a lot of people. And she started wrapping up. I was like, how does that work? How, I mean, I don't know how to apply myself to this. And she said, don't worry. She said, I'll get you on the right track. Mm. She said, my job is to repair you and to heal you. Mm. And I'm going to teach you how to still your mind, which is one of the biggest disciplines we have to get the hang of as light workers. And she referred to the term as light workers, as healers. She said, we've got to be able to still our mind. And when we still our mind, we can then do this work. We can do the mediumship, we can communicate with Charlie. She said, I'm going to show you how to talk to Charlie and how to know when he's around and, and, and when best to talk to him and, and how not to talk to him and so on and so forth. And, and how to actually conjure it up. And um, I was absolutely bamboozled, and it was a total epiphany. It was a total light bulb moment. I just thought, wow. Anyway, that was 10 years ago, and since then, obviously, and that's why we're sitting here today. I mean, I've been on national television. How long did you work with her? Um, I suppose I worked with her probably for a couple of years. I was living there and she was keeping animals, so we became very, very close friends and, and to the point where she was very, very protective of me. She's still around? She passed two years ago. Uh, two years ago to this week, actually, she passed. Um, she was very, very ill. She was young. She was only 46, but she looked, she looked older because she'd been ill for a long time. But there was something really selfless about her. She just gave everything she had to people and yeah. just to be in the service of others. She lived, she lived on fresh air, really. I mean, she had a lovely partner who's Dutch. He had an, he's got an amazing story on his own. I mean, he's an extraordinary soul. He's still around, and I still keep in touch with him from time to time. Um, and she had this sort of enormous collection of animals, everything from Great Danes to lambs to rescue turkeys from Bernard Matthews um, to horses to, to pigs to chickens to bantams, you name it. She had a whole sort of selection of animals that she loved and adored and rescued all the time and mm. I suppose I worked with her for about two years and she taught me she helped to heal me she introduced me to crystals uh, and introduced me to protection and grounding all that sort of stuff all the basic stuff that when we're all sort of going out and we're stepping out we want to learn yeah that people yeah. like us will teach other people yeah how to switch it on how yeah. to switch it on yeah. etc et yeah yeah 